to Second uh, Timothy chapter 3. Just a short reading. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, first five verses. Paul writing to Timothy, the prison epistles. Uh, I never opened the Bible for 20 years at least. I say that to my shame. Um, these verses, I heard them somewhere. And in the months uh, leading up to my, uh, the day I got saved, they played and they played and they played on my consciousness. Uh, reading the Word of God. This know also that in the last day perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affraction, truth beggars, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Uh, those verses just describe me and uh, the man I had become, uh, the people I associated with, and the life I was living. I was born in 1974 in Portadown. Um, I was born, I was coming down the road there and I was listening to a testimony and the testimony said, the man that was giving the testimony said that he was lucky to be born into a Christian home. It wasn't luck that I was born into a Christian home. God ordained before the world was created that I would be born into a Christian home and I thank God that I was born into a Christian home daily. Now, um, my mother and father had three children. I was the runt of the litter, as they call it. Um, my mother and father were saved in Windsor Avenue in the early 70s under Mr. Mung. From a very early age, I was led to know in no uncertain terms that there was a big problem in my life and it was a three-letter word, and it was called sin. And this sin that was in my life was in my nature. It separated me from my God, and that God, in His infinite wisdom, had provided a cure for this sin that was in my life in the form of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, who bled and died for my salvation personally. And I knew this when I was young. My mother and father faithfully sent me to church and Sunday school. So there was no um, clouded gray area when it comes to the gospel in, in my life. I have a sister and a brother. Um, they were 10 years older than me. Uh, I remember my brother, when we were young, complained of having... Um, the sore heads, my father took him down to our doctor and the doctor just sort of palmed it off, said it was a cold, um, it was this, it was that, it was the awe. So we went over to the Isle of Man for a holiday with my grandparents and the holiday was cut short. Uh, Mark was brought home. Uh, we travelled back to Port of Down. We weren't a rich family, we had no money, just three up, two down house. But my dad got money together to send Mark to a specialist in Craig Avon. Uh, the specialist said that Mark had to go down to the Royal immediately. Um, our doctor had misdiagnosed Mark. Uh, Mark had brain tumours. Uh, don't hold this against our doctors. You know, the best of men can make the worst mistakes because they're only men at best. Mark uh, travelled that night down to uh, Ward 41. Uh, neurosurgery in the Royal Victoria Hospital. This was 1980. 
Uh, he on, went, undertook what was the longest operation in the UK at that time. He was on the table for 11 and a half hours. They removed um, two brain tumours from his head. Uh, my bra was, uh, I was seven at the time. My bra was 17, 18. It was 1980, he was a mod, he had black hair. Um, I looked up to my brother and I wanted to be like him. Um, he was a real good looking bloke, I can remember it. I remember going to the hospital that night and being a bit confused about what was going on and getting into the hospital um, going up to the room in intensive cure and just seeing my brother lying there in the bed with an onion sack in his head and uh, tubes coming out of his nose and his mouth. And it freaked me out completely. Uh, I ran out of the hospital, just left it, just left him there. Um, I'm sure there's not a family here that doesn't know about illness, about cancer, about leukemia, about all these diseases. Um, after the initial um, operation, there's a long recuperation time. There was a time in Beaver Park, um, and then Mark returned home. And like I said, we weren't a rich family. We just live in West Street there in Porter Down, three up, two down, nothing special about our, our house. There was a girl and two boys and a mum and dad. So somebody had to share a room with Mark, and that was me. And seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, um, for me at night, was spent late, uh, lying in bed beside my brother, listening to his breathing. Once I twigged that there was an erratic breathing, I would go in and tell my mum, the ambulance would come, Mark would be carted off to the hospital and then down to Beaver, and this was a cycle uh, that became a normality for me. Mark lived for five years after the initial um, operation. Mark lived those five years for his God and for his Savior. He was a witness. Mark knew all the hard men in the town. And he was a witness to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he had done in our Mark's life. And then the Lord took our Mark home. And uh, you know the death, how a death upsets a family. I was very young. I was 12. I had lived with this for these years. And uh, I can remember walking behind my uh, brother's funeral cortege and looking at my mother and my father and my sister and just seeing the sadness and thinking to myself at that stage, if this is what a God that you love does to you, uh, and I sort of I keel back from saying this now, but I did say it in my life, like I said, well, I don't want nothing to do with your God anymore. And uh, at 12, I turned my back on God um, in rebellion and wanted nothing more to do with him. Um, my mum, this death in our family had sent my mum into hospital. My sister joined the British Army and was stationed all over the year, all over the world. There was only me and my dad. And I'll tell you about the power of a testimony as George has spoken about there. My dad never missed a prayer meeting. Never missed a prayer meeting. Have you children here and they're causing you concern? Or is your, have your friend they're causing you concern? And you need to pray for that person and pray on. And when it gets dark and when it gets tight, don't stop. Pray on. Because I'm standing here tonight because people prayed for me and people didn't stop praying for me. Now, um, I, I, that left me cold. And uh, people give their testimonies and uh, they retort the sins that they have done in their life. And I'm not going to do that. So if you come here looking to hear that, you're far right. I'm not doing that tonight. Um, I can look every one of you in the eye and I can tell every one of you that my fall into sin was absolutely complete. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. God, I could have died, and God has just set me into hell any time in those 20 years, uh, and God would have been completely right to do it because I, I just completely forgot about God.
I can look back, laugh, uh, and laugh now, but uh, we went on a holiday to Turkey. And uh, we come home from Turkey, we flew into Dublin Airport. And my friends were there to collect us. My best mate was there, me and my wife. And uh, come off the plane, and, and they met me coming off the plane, and he said to me, Johnny, we'll have bad news, and we'll have worse news for you. And I just got, got off the plane, and I said, what's the bad news? And he says, you've got 48 hours to get out of the country, you're going to get shot. And I said, what's the worst news? And he says, your 48 hours was up 10 days ago. So I, I, was, I was stuck, and that's the sort of person um, that I had become. I am, all of my close friends were in uh, loyalist paramilitaries. And, and you know, in, in my life now, I, I hear the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all, and thousands more, but Jehovah findeth none. Uh, the only thing that I could salvage out of those 20 years of my life is, uh, you know, my mum and dad's testimony. I have an appreciation for the boundless and the matchless grace of God. I have a life experience uh, that not many folks understand. And I can talk to drug addicts, I can talk to uh, drunkards, and I can talk to them on their level. And I met my wife in those 20 years when I was 21. These 20 years, it's just 20 years of circles, you know, just going round and round and round. The drunkard lives for the next drink. The addict lives for the next hit. The gambler lives for the next bet. Uh, the football fanatic lives for the next match. You know, uh, the, ma the working man with the family lives his whole year for the two weeks that he will spend away in, in Spain or wherever. And it's just circles and circles. And I was asking myself, is this all that life has to offer? In the book of Ecclesiastics, Solomon says that there is nothing new under the sun. And he's correct. And I was 31. Uh, I've just missed out 20 years of my life completely there. When I was 31, I changed jobs. And uh, I met a man in this company that I presently still work for. He called him Davy. He was a Presbyterian. And uh, a lot of the men, you know, they had no time for him. Talk behind his back, say this about him, say that about him. You know, he was this and he was that and the other. Uh, and, uh, but I, I was never like that, you know, I, I never listened to what people said about all people. To me, you stand and fall, to me, the way you live your life. And uh, I watched this man, and this man was different from all the rest of the men. He was a Christian, and he had a testimony. And there was something in him that was different from everybody else that I worked with. And it was Christ, it was Christ that I could see in this man. Um, you know, 2 Timothy 3.12 says that all them that live godly in Christ Jesus uh, will suffer persecution. I had been with Helm for 13 years when we got married uh, in 2006. My marriage wasn't really going that well after the first couple of years. Uh, I had eye disease. You know, everything was I, I, me, me selfish. That's just the way I was, and I didn't really think about other people. I just thought about having my life, my way. And, uh, but that was all on the top, because inside, deep inside, there was an unease in my life. See, God has created us all, that there is a void within us, and there's only one thing will fill that void, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was asking questions of myself, of people, eh, about what life was about, and you know, I knew that there was a lot of sin in my life. And if the Bible was true, you know, I had an appointment to keep one day. Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. In October 2008, we were expecting our first child. And things had to change in my life because I was never in the house. I was always out. I was running about doing this, that, and the other. 
and there was a wee child coming into our house. And I tried to change uh, so many times, but I, I, I just couldn't do it. I could, there, was something, there was something inside me that just, I just kept reverting back to uh, where I was, and it was causing arguments between me and Hal. But every time that I had went down to my mother and father's house just to call in to see them, I always, my mother always had Pastor Mullen on. The tapes would be going. And he could not help but listen to what this preacher was saying. But I never let on, I was listening to it. But it was truth. And I was hungering and searching after truth. And it, I took it into my head that I would, I would train for the marathon. So I bought myself an iPod and I went online. I went on to a, a site um, and I downloaded hundreds of Willie Mullen sermons and began to train for the mar marathon. And uh, it would be me out on the roads training, running mile after mile and just uh, Pastor Mullen on in my ear, just uh, constantly preaching the gospel uh, and the truth about how God was manifested in the flesh in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, how he lived a sinless, perfect life. He upheld the law totally, completely, never sinned at all. And I, and I had a, a hunger for this inside me and I wanted to hear it and I wanted to find out. I heard about how he went to the cross how he died, how he became my savior before he became my substitute because I had to have a savior before I had a substitute. And, and Mr. Mullen got this across to me in my ears and uh, uh, I was just training and training and training uh, 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 on the teaching. And there was a conviction of sin in my life that I cannot convey across to anybody in this meeting. I know what it is to stand in the dock and to have a sentence passed on you. And I would rather any day of the week stand in the dock than have to go through that again. It, eat, it was eating at me. It was affecting every part of my life. It was despair. It was dread. It was fear. It was all the negatives that you can think of. And it was inside me. It was conviction. Uh, are you here the night and you're not saved? And the veneer of your life, the top layer of your life, seems as if everything is okay. And you are toddling by in your life and there is no problem at all. Everybody thinks that everything is tickety-boo with you. But underneath the surface, is there this conviction? Are you right with God? Have you met his son? Have you been to the cross? And uh, you know, uh, Bunyan speaks of a great burden and he's spot on because that's what it was. Now this man that I worked with, Davy, he invited me to come to a Christianity Explored uh, meeting in his church on a Sunday. And uh, out of respect for him, out of the way he lived his life and who he was, I said I was, I would. And I thought I was doing this man a favor. I stayed sober on the Saturday night, uh, got myself dressed, and went over to his church on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we were all sitting, and we were having a, a conversations, and we were talking away, and then they split off into wee groups. And there was a, we have a saying for a wee, wee girl up our way, a wee slip of a girl, I don't know if you said that, but this wee slip of a girl, she's an eight stone nahan, five foot nahan, and uh, she was stand, standing in front of me, talking away to me, and she gave me her testimony. And she had more guts in her fingernail and her wee finger than I had in every fibre of my being. That's meant to be a hard man, uh, mouth, hard. That's all it was. This wee girl put me in the play. I couldn't believe how for forward this wee girl was about giving me her testimony talking about a Christ that loved her and died for her. And she just, uh, just confirmed my fears completely. 
that I was lost. I was completely lost and on my way to hell. Um, just suddenly come to my mind in that meeting that night, something that Mr. Mullen said, a dead fish float with the tide, but no life in them. And I had no life. I was lifeless. I existed. I have an existence, but I had no life. As George has said, you know, the Lord Jesus came to give us life and to give us it more abundantly. Now, Helen, my wife, noticed that there was an unhappiness in my life, but there was nothing that she could do about it. Our first child was born on the 3rd of March in 2009. Lauren, beautiful, healthy young lady, young girl. Um, I remember getting home with the child, all the parents, you know, your first child, you get home, come in through the door and you have the child, and you look at each other, what do you do now? You go and put the tail on, you have a cup of tea. And I remember I was standing in the, standing in the, in the kitchen and I was holding the child in my arms and Helen looked at me and she said, eh, are you happy now? And I said, yes, I'm happy. But there was something eh, missing still in my life because like I said there, that's how God made me. You can try and plug that void with whatever you want, money, work, drink, drugs, gambling, children, family. At the end of the day, when you're left with yourself, and you're standing in the mirror, and you take the face off that the world sees, and you put it, and you're there by yourself, God has made you that the only thing that can bring full and complete joy to your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this, this is what was missing uh, in my life. The next few weeks um, were just, I don't want to say this, but they really were just a hell on earth for me, just living uh, with that conviction on me. You know, I had absolutely everything a man could want. I had a lovely house. I had two cars in the drive, a lovely wife, and a lovely wee family. Uh, I didn't do the lottery, but I had money in the bank. I had respect, I had a good job, I had everything. But I had absolutely nothing. I was bankrupt, I was just broke. Uh, as I was training for the, for the, the lottery, or for the, the training for the, the marathon, I was out doing one of my final big runs, um, and I was just coming home, um, the Lockall Road, you know the Lockall Road there, George, that's very hilly, it's very narrow. And I was just coming home, running in through Port Down, up the Lockall Road, about a mile from home. And a 40 foot lorry come flying past me, just full of steel, carrying eye beams, must have been about 30 ton on it. And it come that close to me, as I stand here now, I can still feel it going past me when I think about it nearly drew the breath out of my lungs, zooming past me, and I just stopped dead, and something just said to me, if that lorry had hit you, you'd have been dead. And if you'd have been dead, you would have been in hell. And I walked that last mile home, crying my eyes out that day. Um, my mother and father bought me this as a wedding present, this Bible. Of all the wedding presents that I got, this is the only one that remains. And this is the most precious present that I was ever bought. Would you please turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Please bear in mind that I had not opened a Bible for 20 years. And as I come home that night, crying, I pulled the, the, the drawers open with this Bible there in the back of the drawer, and I opened this Bible, took it out of the plastic, pulled the, pulled the cardboard off it, and took the Bible and threw it down onto the bed. The Bible opened at uh, chapter 4, verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, 
but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promised the life that now is and that which is to come. And God was speaking to me directly. God spoke to me directly through his word for the first time in my life that night. And I knew it, and it scared the tar out of me. I can remember sitting on the side of the bed and my leg shaking because I was that scared. Helen came into the room and uh, she said, what's wrong with you? I told her what happened and she thought I was mad. She thought I'd completely, she thought that the drink and the drugs had just went through to my brain and I had lost, lost the plot completely. Um, but I knew that God was speaking to me from what I had learned when I was a child in Sunday school and going to church. And uh, she, she couldn't do nothing about it. Um, went to work the next day, was uh, in work, was listening to Mr. Mullen in the store. Mr. Mullen was speaking on um, Revelations 20. I think we should just turn to this here and we'll just read. This is a final reading tonight. So please just turn your Bibles there to Revelation uh, 20. The Lord will not uh, speak through what it, he'll move through his own word, not my words. I was listening to Pastor Mullen um, speaking, uh, and uh, starting at verse 11, Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I was thinking about that the day, this afternoon, and the wife took the children out, and she just let me have a wee bit of time preparing for the night. I actually thought about that. You know, they say that there is two things that are sure in life, their death and taxes. But that's not true, because there are constants in life. The ground under your feet, the air that you breathe, the sky above your head, these are all constants in your life. There's a day coming when all of these will flee from the throne of God. God will just roll it all up like a script and that'll be it. And where will you stand in that day? Will you be here? Will you face this judgment? Will you go through your life without being redeemed by the precious blood. Go out into eternity without naming Christ as your Savior. And you will have to face this. And we'll just read on here. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, all the wee secret things that we have done in our life, all the things that have been done where men and women have thought that nobody saved them, that they were safe and that they get away with, well, they will all be revealed in the final day. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. That's the truth. And this is my verse. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And as I heard that in work, that was me. I was bait. Something gave, something snapped. Um, I went and clocked out. I just walked out of work. I had to get home. The only person that I knew that could solve this problem was in Westry, was my dad Walter, was my dad. I had gotten so far away from the God that loved me, that sent his son to die for me. I had gotten so far away from him that I didn't know how to get back to him. I remember driving the four mile from where I worked to my father's house at 30 mile an hour, petrified that I would have a car accident and be killed and be flung out into eternity, into hell, where I deserved to go. But I got home. Um, I got to the house, I jumped out of the car, 
Don't need notes for this anymore. Best day of my life. I'll never forget this day. I'll never forget what happened this day. I come out of the car and I walked into my house, but my, my wife was there with my child. I wasn't expecting that. I thought my dad would be there and everything would be tickety be and I'd just meet my dad and, and whatever, but the wife was there. She was like the last hurdle that I had to get over, get past. Uh, I don't know what happened, I walked out the back, my ma had a cup of tea waiting for me. I was sitting out the back, sitting in the shade having a fag, and uh, I don't know what happened. I know the Spirit of God moved mightily in my life when I was sitting in that shed. Something happened and I got up out of that uh, seat in the shed. I went into the room, I looked at my dad in the eye, and I burst into tears, and I said, Da, I'm a liar, I'm afraid, and I need to get saved. My dad, dad burst out laughing. He burst out laughing in my face. He said, Praise the Lord, son. Come on up the stairs. I went up the stairs, uh, we got down in the room. Uh, I remember kneeling beside my father, saying to my father, Dad, I've done some terrible, terrible things in my life. My dad just looked at me in the eye and he said, Son, Calvary covers it all. And on the 24th of the 4th, 2009, at half one in the afternoon, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saved me. And I knew right then and right there that something that had happened. And I went down the stairs and Helen was there. I didn't know what was going to happen, if Helen was going to stay with me, if she was going to leave me, if she was going to take the child. Uh, it was strange. I went up home that night and my dad took me to the brethren in a hurry. It's only saved 25 minutes and he took me to the brethren. <laughs> But uh, Roly Pickering it was, and uh, it was great. Praise the Lord, it was great. I went to church on Sunday, that Sunday, I remembered the Lord for the first time in my life when I was 30, uh, 34. I cried my eyes out through the whole service, cried my eyes out, um, and I still cry six years later. Um, Helen, my wife, she said that she would uh, stay with me. She's seen an absolute and a complete change in my life. The drink stopped, the drugs stopped, everything stopped that day. My, the men that I hung about with completely stopped. I was about to, that Friday afternoon, I had to do a wedding, I had to be a groomsman for a close friend. I got the phone out and I, I done a text message. And my life has changed, I've got saved. Everything, you know, changed from it. I understand if you don't want me to be your groomsman. Just before I sent that tax message, I knew that if I sent that tax message, it would be completely around the town that I'd got saved. Um, and something just said to me, Johnny, your life changed an hour ago. And you give it to the Lord. You're not going to send this tax message. I sent the tax message. I went right around the town and all the pubs all the drug stands, everybody knew that I got saved. And I haven't been back in the pub since. Praise the Lord. Thank God for it. My wife wasn't saved, like I said. Um, that Tuesday night, um, I went to the prayer meeting for the first time. Um, I took my place in the prayer meeting. I began to pray for my wife as my father had prayed for me. Um, I can remember, you know, how still went out, went out to clubs and all. I can remember Saturday nights sitting in the hall in our house on my knees, praying liquid tears or liquid prayers, praying my eyes out over my wife. Um, and 14 months later, Helen come to a gospel mission or a gospel message that we were having. Dennis was uh, preaching. He preached on Felix. The, the hymn that we're going to sing at the end here was the hymn that we sung the night that Helen got saved. Um, Dennis preached, and almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And um, Felix trembled. Uh, that night, Helen trembled. I, I had the wit to shut my mouth in the car. The tears rolled down her face. Tears of conviction that I had. 
a few days after that, she was gloriously saved. Um, the power of us is saved now. God has blessed us with another two children, two boys. Um, I just can't explain to you how grateful I am to God for sending his son um, to save a worthless sinner like me. You know, people say that it's a mind condition, that you have uh, been brought up into this way, that you have, uh, that there's something wrong with you and that it's not real. But I'm telling you here tonight that it is real. That it is real. It's realer than anything else. This world and this life that we live now, someday this will all pass. I'll pass out into eternity. I'll see my brother and I'll see other family members, but most of all, I'll see my Savior, and I'll get to thank him through the countless ages of eternity um, for what he has done for me. I would ask you tonight in this meeting, do you know him as your Savior? Do you? Um, what would keep you back from him? Would it be fear? Would it be what your friends would say? Friends, He's trustworthy, he's true, and he's waiting for you, uh, and he'll save you to the uttermost, because he's a mighty saviour. And we'd just like to thank you all for having me, and we'll just bow in prayer, and then we'll sing a hymn. Our God and Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, not for the testimony that I have but for what you have done for me and in my life. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to leave the ivory palaces, Lord, out there in eternity, to come into this sinful world. Lord, to thank you that you took on the form of a, form of a man. You were found as a servant, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you were spotless, holy, undefiled before men. Yet, Lord, you were separate from sinners. Thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross. Lord, for a guilty sinner like me. Thank you, Lord, that in there you bore my sin in your body on the tree. You went down into death. Thank you, Lord, that death couldn't hold you. The third day you rose again. And thank you, Lord, that you're seated right now at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thank you, Lord, that the times that we live in declare the coming of the Son of Man soon to take his bride home. Lord, we pray that there won't be a hoof left behind all the people in this church. Lord, we just thank you for so great salvation. We pray for the message of the gospel that is going across the province tonight. Pray, Lord, that you will save sinners, men and women, boys and girls, Lord, bring them into the kingdom of God. We ask all these things for our Saviour's <coughs> glory. Amen. We sung this hymn, The Night My Wife Was Saved. 292.